it's been a little while since I've done one of these prediction videos where I just kind of lay everything out. And I realize that there's probably been a little bit of perceived inconsistency in my position lately. So I wanted to take a moment to clear all that up. And so what I mean is that, you know, like, yes, I am expecting a downturn. Uh, we're entering into the trough of disillusionment. And I do think that we're in for a little bit of a disappointing uh, period with artificial intelligence. However, I still remain pretty optimistic. So let's just dive in and let's go over the next few years from now until 2030, kind of some of the milestones that I expect to see. And what I want to tell you before we dive in is that this is not just speculation on my part. I have been talking to industry insiders uh, from around the world and uh, from looking at AI from various pr perspectives um, in conversations behind the scenes for the last couple of weeks. So I'm a little bit more oriented than I used to be. So hopefully this uh, will prove to be a little bit more accurate than some of my predictions in the past. So without further ado, let's dive right in. So first, how are we going to uh, close out 2024? Now, obviously, in the past, I was predicting AGI by the end of this year. And um, but, you know, with other people commenting, uh, you know, such as uh, Leopold Aschenbrenner, um, it looks like 2027 is kind of when people are settling on AGI. Then the confidence intervals, you know, are give and take a little bit. We'll get into that in just a minute. But let's focus on the rest of this year. So GPT-5 is expected to drop uh, this year as early as fall, but likely December or early 2025. Claude 4 is um, also expected around that time. Um, now, what Anthropic is doing right now is they're working on the rest of the 3.5 family, but the cadence is accelerating with releasing these foundation models. Um, and while I have said that AI is slowing down, what I'm mostly looking at is the cost uh, increasing. So basically, the uh, the breakthroughs that we that we're hoping to see are going to be happening slower, even if the cadence of model releases is uh, a little bit faster. Because I was looking at the timelines and it was, I think it was from, from GPT-3 to GPT-4 was a full three years. And so GPT-4 to GPT-5 looks like it might be two, two and a half-ish years. So the overall cadence is more or less keeping up to pace, but, the, but there are more or less just incremental changes. And so, yes, incremental changes can do a lot, particularly the incremental changes we've seen on context windows of reasoning abilities and those sorts of things. We're also going to see a lot more multimodality. Obviously, um, some of the demos that have been presented by Google and Microsoft and OpenAI, um, the demos were one thing. Some of them were faked, um, and in many cases, they've overpromised and underdelivered. Um, but that's kind of the news that y'all are all familiar with. One thing that I think that we're that is probably going to be like the last you know big shocking thing that we see this year is the release of more commercial and potentially domestic robots. Um, if you haven't been keeping up with the news, there are so many companies in China, America, and and other places that are working diligently on humanoid robots for various purposes. Disney, interestingly, has some of the most advanced robotics programs, but they're just using it for like stunt doubles and animatronics. And I'm like. You guys have no idea what you're sitting on. You have the most lifelike robots and you're using it for entertainment. What are you doing? Anyways, um, I'll get off my soapbox about Disney. So uh, I think that I think that, you know, because if you've seen like the Boston Dynamics videos and you know, and everything else coming out about humanoid robots, I think that this is going to be the next step shift, um, the next step change in the AI and robotics space. Because again, models were, were getting to the point of diminishing returns with the current paradigm of models, meaning that getting those next breakthroughs is going to be exponentially more expensive. But at the same time, once you get to a certain threshold, it doesn't really matter. Because like, okay, you can have, like once you get models that are PhD smart, what are you going to go after that? Like 10x PhD? Okay, sure. Like, yes, we can debate intelligence till the cows come home. Um, but my point here is that 2024... We're not going to have a whole lot more exciting news. I think robotics is going to be the next most exciting thing. Um, Sora and video generators are going to be really interesting, um, but I suspect that we're going to find that getting getting to like super crisp, like Hollywood ready 4K and 8K video is going to be a little bit harder. Just in the same way that you know language models have mastered language, but getting it to Shakespeare, we're not there yet. Now, 2025, I think, is going to be the year of the disillusionment, where a lot of people, myself included, are going to be kind of disappointed, like, okay, GPT-5 hit, and it's definitely smarter, it's definitely PhD level in some respects, but it's not quite going to be AGI. Same thing with Claude 4. Um, I think it's 
pretty safe to assume that GPT-5 and Claude 4 will be out by 2025 or probably early 2025. Now, one thing that I will say is that um, I expect these models to get to like the 95th percentile across multiple benchmarks. Um, and you might say like, okay, that sounds pretty good. And in the old paradigm of machine learning, once you get to the 95th percentile, um, that's basically considered a solved problem in machine learning. And so right now, depending on which benchmark you're looking at, they're you know, anywhere from the 40th percentile to the 85th percentile. And those last few percentage points usually are much, much harder to, to solve, at least until you get an algorithmic breakthrough. And this has happened many, many times in the AI space, um, obviously before Transformers. Um, but, you know, I remember listening to podcasts about, um, you know, uh, like uh, decision trees and those sorts of things and XG boost. Um, and when those new techniques were introduced, uh, you know, many, many problems went from 70th percentile to 95th percentile. And then those competitions were no longer interesting after that. So what I mean, like when, like, what are the implications when we get you know, to the 95th percentile on all the benchmarks today. I think we're going to realize that a lot of the benchmarks to d that exist today are not particularly useful or helpful, which is why I've been kind of critical of them, um, is because it's like, okay, it's good at taking a test, but real intelligence is about long time horizons, chaotic environments, um, and adaptation. And there's not really testing that right now. So like, when people ask me, like, what's a good benchmark for intelligence? I'm like, there are none right now. There are literally no good benchmarks out there that I have been impressed by that really measure intelligence. Yes, some of them are really interesting um, and, and you know, definitely are measuring some aspects of intelligence, such as reasoning in an abstract state. But, you know, you can have the best person who's, you know, great at math, great at, you know, reasoning in abstract uh, concepts who still has no street smarts or real world intelligence or the ability to make things happen in the real world. Um, so huh, first contact with the real world is going to be very messy for these AI models. But what I will say is that as these benchmarks uh, get met, and also as we get more distilled models, more uh, refined models, um, that they're going to be much more cost effective because it's like, okay, if you have a model that is basically free to run and it's as good as, you know, someone with two or three years of experience, that's going to start turning some heads and start replacing some jobs. So I do suspect that 2025, we're going to see a lot more enterprise deployment. What I'm hearing out there right now is that most people deploying AI are small and medium businesses because they can pivot faster. And I am hearing that enterprise corporations are looking at this stuff but none of the leadership are convinced that it is enterprise ready. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, however, because the small and medium businesses are going to, are going to start adopting more AI tools, either tools, you know, like copilot provided by Microsoft and GitHub or tools built by startups, you're going to see a surge in people basically either in the startup space, building these new tools or at some of these larger companies, um, building AI products for companies. And then, of course, you're going to have some internal hiring for uh, uh, for internal talent to deploy and utilize AI. Um, but I think that 2025 is still going to be a rel relatively tepid year, at least at the enterprise scale. Um, but SMBs usually, and SMB, if you're not familiar, is small and medium businesses. So those are those are like the mom and pop shops up to like you know 400 employees or so, a thousand employees. I'm not really sure where. The, uh, the the transition point from SMB to enterprises today. And of course, there's many intermediary steps. Anyways, getting lost in the weeds. My point is, is that smaller companies can pivot faster. So we're probably going to see more hiring in the startup space um, and the SMB space where AI is concerned. And then, of course, there's also going to be um, a lot of internal hiring at the uh, at like the Microsoft and Google and those sorts of things. Um, but those companies tend to be a little bit more insular uh, meaning like if you're in the club, you're in the club and they don't really like outsiders. Um, they're very clickish like that. But at the same time, I think that we're going to start seeing a little bit more jobs dislocation in 2025 um, as the uh, capabilities of these models expand. But again, there's a lot of skepticism um, in the C-suite of enterprises. And I don't just mean tech enterprises. I mean, you know, finance, law, like across the board, manufacturing, a lot of them are watching it and they're like, oh yeah, that's interesting. We'll check on it in a couple of years. So that's, that's why it's like, you know, sorry to throw a bucket of cold water on it, but even if we get AGI tomorrow, it's going to take a few years to get fully um, integrated into, um, into the world and into the economy so that we can all, you know, live post-labor economic, you know, utopian lifestyles. 
Um, but I do suspect that uh, 2025 will be the year that a lot of our benchmarks um, are broken, and then we'll have to have an entirely new set of benchmarks. So based on all of these trends, 2026 is the year that I think that, um, that these models are going to be considered enterprise ready. Um, so there, we're going to be on the other side of the trough of disillusionment, um, particularly with, uh, you know, Claude 6 or, you know, uh, sorry, Claude 5 or GPT-6 or 5.5 or whatever the models are. I think that those two more generations from now are going to be when, uh, when all of the enterprises on Fortune 500 all around the world um, are going to be saying, this is enterprise ready. We are ready to go. And these are going to be what are, what are going to be considered the first true general purpose models. And so what I mean by general purpose models is basically kind of what NVIDIA is working on, which is like any, like X to X or any to any modality, um, because then you just have a model that is a, it is a ready to go off the shelf droid brain. You can put the same model in a car, a chassis, a digital agent, those sorts of things. And that's really what we're aiming for is those general purpose models. And I don't mean just, you know, just text, just a few tools, just audio video, I mean like anything, geospatial data, sensory data, embodiment data, everything to everything is what I'm really looking for, for them to be truly enterprise ready and general purpose. And by then people might be saying, yeah, this basically qualifies as AGI. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we call those early AGI and then what we're talking about for AGI in 2027, 2028 actually constitutes ASI. Because like, think of it this way, if you have a general purpose model that you can put in a robot and that robot can perform at the level of like basically any person with five years of experience, I think that would probably constitute AGI. But then if you have, you know, two more generations later, you have a model that you can do anything with and it's basically like every PhD on the planet, I would consider that super intelligence. So, you know, your mileage may vary depending on definition, but really from a, from a commercial economic standpoint and, and downstream from that, from a, uh, from the impact that you will feel, Enterprise ready general purpose models is really where it's going to be at. And this is where um, people are really going to start taking notice um, around the world. Um, now, that's also two years down the road from now. So that'll be midterm elections time. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if AI starts being talked about more in politics than it is already being talked about. Also, by that time, I wouldn't be surprised like if, you know, you many of us have domestic uh, robots helping with cooking and cleaning by that point. Um, they're probably going to be pretty expensive. I know like the first gen are going to be like $80,000, which it's like you could buy a Mercedes for that, uh, a nice Mercedes um, or a nice truck, like a really nice truck. Um, but there's also going to be so much competition because the, me the, the, the electromechanical aspect of these robots, not particularly expensive. And once you get to economies of scale, the chassis is going to be $2,000 to maybe four or $5,000 for a good one. Um, but it, then it's the software that you put in it. It's the brain and the integration and, and the testing to make it useful. So I wouldn't be surprised if 2026 is probably the year that like I buy my first domestic assistant robot, maybe before then, I don't know. I know that there are some other YouTubers out there that have bought like the, the very first ones and they, you know, it's like, cool, you test it, but it's not really useful. It's not really a good product market fit yet. So 2027 is expected to be the year of AGI. So, and again, confidence uh, intervals vary quite a bit. So, you know, some people say like 2026, 5%, 2027, 50 to 90%, 2028 to 2029. It's like, seems like a foregone conclusion, at least for some industry insiders that we will have AGI by then. But again, like I said, it depends on your definition. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if 2027, 2028 is when those general purpose enterprise models are all PhD level. Now, even when you have that, it's still going to take time because there is so much inertia for, ad for adoption. Um, like governments will be paying attention, militaries will be paying attention, all corporations will be paying attention. Um, and what I wanna point out here is that once that excitement builds back up, investors will be pushing for rapid AI adoption meaning that all CEOs are basically going to be incentivized to go as fast as possible, which is why I always say that acceleration is kind of the default policy. The same thing is true on the geopolitical stage. Um, America is going as fast as possible. Uh, China is going as fast as possible. Everyone is going as fast as possible to develop AI. And once you get to the point where AI is actually modifying the landscape, the competitive landscape, whether it's free market economics or military landscape, everyone is going to be locked into that arms race. Now, uh, once you get to this point, um, there's like some of the some of the things that are going to slow down is going to be regulatory constraints, 
um, internal adoption policies, safety research, um, but you're also going to see a lot of creative, creative disruption. I would not be surprised if 2026 or maybe even 2027 is when we see the first like feature-length Hollywood blockbuster film created entirely by AI. We've got a little bit of time before, you know, like we're already seeing people stitching together, you know, like commercials and stuff with AI, but that's a human doing it and editing it. What I mean is like end-to-end -end production, you push a button and you get a, you know, you get a out pops a 4K Hollywood grade, you know, movie on the other side, you know, a couple hours or a couple days later, however long it takes. Um, it'll be a little while before models are that good where they can produce something that is not just, you know, some postmodern art house garbage um, that doesn't really make any sense because we can do that now uh, with AI. But what I mean is something that is going to like make a billion dollars at the box office um, 2027. I'm not going to put money on that, but like I wouldn't be surprised if the first billion dollar uh, box office blockbuster happens in 2027 or thereabouts. And that will kind of coincide with, you know, AGI or whatever. Um, and we're going to see a lot more. Again, we're going to see broader impacts. We might start to see some layoffs, but really I think that it's going to be a hot button political issue for the following year, the next election cycle. So speaking of the election cycle, I think that 2028 is going to be a really spicy year. Um, there's a lot that's going to be happening uh, around that time. So having watched a lot of uh, military insiders, um, interviews with generals, admirals, and other people from the intelligence community, and just following closely on kind of the longer term uh, trends that are happening in geopolitics, I think that 2028 is basically going to be a, hey, we're gearing up for a new arms race. We're gearing up for a new conflict with China. Um, at the same time, we're going to start to see those mass layoffs because, again, once you get AGI, you still need to you still need to invest in it. You still need to deploy it. You still need to integrate into it. So I think that we're going to be seeing like kind of having this one two punch of a new Cold War or maybe even a hot war. We'll see. But new geopolitical uh, uh, conflict at the same time that we're going to start seeing mass layoffs due to uh, the integration of AGI and robotics. Um, and so it's going to be a very, very contentious uh, election cycle. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're talking about AI safety, job protection, universal basic income, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so it's basically going to be a fever pitch crisis year. And I'm not basing that just off of my own stuff. In fact, before I was reading you know, stuff like um, The Fourth Turning and Ray Dalio's work and talking to a few other people, you know, it's like, well... the it seems like everything is going to be coming to a head sooner rather than later. And I think that 2028 might be kind of the inflection point. Another thing is that there's a lot of commentators that suspect that conflict with China is going to happen between sometime between 2026 and 2032. And that election year, the, you know, the, the advent of AGI robotics, you know, quantum computing and fusion um, kind of on the horizon that really could be the inflection point. And one other thing is that the clock is ticking for China because they're facing demographic collapse. Um, basically, the, the, their, their demographic pyramid is inverted right now because they're having so few births. And it actually looks like, if you watch the news coming out of China very closely, it looks like they might, might have been lying about their population numbers for several years. So China's population might already be shrinking in the order of tens of millions to even pot potentially hundreds of millions per year Again, it depends on who you listen to, but it seems like a foregone conclusion that China's population is shrinking. And that basically means that the clock is ticking for them. Any big moves that they want to do, they need to do sooner rather than later while they still have the manpower to do it, um, which means that that could move up any timeline for any potential conflict with China. And it doesn't necessarily have to escalate to a hot conflict. And again, all that's going to be going on on the geopolitical stage and, uh, and in the meantime, we're going to be having domestic issues potentially with layoffs and, you know, the economy is going to be on fire and yet wages are going to be stagnating. Total employment might be going down by then. Unemployment might be going up. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of anger um, around this time. I'm not going to say that it's going to be like, you know, the next Great Depression or anything like that because geopolitical conflict has a tendency to um, do good things for jobs in the economy which, you know, I wish that weren't true, but, you know, the military industrial complex exists. You know, don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger. Now, 2029, I think, is going to be um, really when most people, like, kind of his history will, will record 2023 as the year that it started. 
2024, the year that it accelerated. But I think that 2029 is going to be the year that everyone is like, yes, this is the beginning of the new renaissance because this is when all the gigantic new data centers are going to come online. This is when um, the commercial nuclear fusion reactors are expected to see first light. This is when quantum computing is going to become mainstream. And then all the downstream effects of that, namely material science and genetic engineering, will basically, you'll start to see that flywheel accelerate and you'll start to see real true compounding returns um, from all of these technologies mixing together. And, you know, it might be a foregone conclusion by then that like we have ASI or whatever. Um, robots are going to be much more commonplace. We're going to really start to see a major shift in medical breakthroughs. Longevity escape velocity is something that people are going to be talking about. Um, you're going to see more cybernetics, those sorts of things. But this is basically like the year that it all begins or the year that it really changes. And from a from an individual perspective, I suspect that this is when we're going to start to see a new level of optimism, um, kind of akin to the post-war boom of the 1950s. Hopefully it doesn't, it's not delayed, like because a, con, a, a hot conflict with China could be devastating to not just the two nations, but to the whole world. So I hope that it doesn't escalate to a hot conflict. And it's entirely possible that it won't. Um, the way that America and China are communicating makes me think that it's just going to be another Cold War, um, which, okay, that's not the best thing in the world, um, but that's certainly far preferable to a hot conflict. Um, but then at the same time, all of those, you know, like basically think of the optimism of the 60s and 70s during the space age, right? We're going to have that level of optimism again. And again, it's not just me predicting that. Uh, Ray Dalio, fourth, uh, the fourth turning, a lot of these theories think that we're, that we're at or near an inflection point and that after the inflection point, it's going to be much, much better in the future. Now, obviously, I'm not one to live in the future, but you know, we all need something to hope for and we need some optimism. Um, so I think 2029 is, is really kind of targeting that when uh, enterprise level adoption is going to be accelerating, geopolitics is going to be changing, and then that will lead into 2030, which is kind of the year that it's like, okay, this is going to be the new normal. So in 2030, I suspect we will have coined a new term. We might call it the intelligence age because, you know, I was just referring to like the space age. So, you know, the 60s, 70s, um, I guess early in the or late, late in the 50s, 60s and 70s. That was like the space age. And then the 80s and 90s, that was, you know, the information age. Um, and now we've had the grim dark age of the 2000s and 2010s and early 2020s. I think that we're going to be entering into entering fully into the new paradigm of the intelligence age or the AI age um, by 2030. This is where we're going to be basically kind of settling into the new normal of the fourth industrial revolution, um, which is why I frequently kind of compare 2030 to like 2050 or uh, 1950, because these cycles generally come in about 60 to 80 year cycles, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. So we are basically overdue or almost overdue for a new like new renaissance or new um, golden era. And so I'm hoping that by 2030, we are entering into that new golden era. And I've been, I've been pretty consistent on this messaging for a while, that the next five years are going to be some of the hardest, most painful years because old paradigms are going to stop working and we're going to start to need new paradigms, namely post-labor economics. So when the first time that Bloomberg and Forbes and all those other ones um, talk about post-labor economics, I will be super excited. Um, but it seems basically inevitable uh, that the that economics as we understand it today will just not work. I do think that money is going to stick around and I think capitalism is going to stick around, but I think that neoliberalism is on its last legs um, and that's going to go the way of the dinosaurs. Anyways, that's personal speculation. Um, longevity escape velocity. Ray Kurzweil predicts that longevity escape velocity will come by 2030. And as many of you in the audience say, don't ever bet against Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> now, I will say, having read some of his older books, some of his predictions were dead wrong, but some of his predictions were were pretty much spot on. Um, so he, his his batting average is like you know, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7, um, which is certainly good given the time horizons that he's been working on. Um, but this is one where I I tend to agree that you know longevity, escape velocity, all those compounding returns from AI, quantum computing, and all the downstream effects of that. I, th I certainly think that we could achieve longevity escape velocity by 2030. Um, the socioeconomic shifts, I think that we'll, we'll probably have something like UBI by then, um, but we'll also realize that UBI alone is not enough. We'll need an entirely new approach to um, finding meaning, uh, giving people stuff to do, that sort of thing. Um, 
I also hope that this new era of abundance will reshape the geopolitical conversation, but it will also be a little bit early. And what I mean by early is that even if we all have AGI and hyperabundance, it's going to take several generations, if not longer. I mean, it could take several centuries to really kind of heal the planet and have everyone come together um, because there's just so much distrust and so much inertia, so much geopolitical inertia out there. Um, I certainly hope that we don't have any more wars once we have nuclear fusion and AGI because, you know, the weapons that that are capable uh, of being produced then. Who was it? I, I think someone said, was it James Cameron? I don't remember. Someone said, I don't know what weapons World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. That's really kind of the paradigm that we're looking at. If I hope that we don't have a World War III, and if we don't, then I think we're going to be um, all... all I'm not going to say happily ever after because we're humans. We're good at making a mess of things, but I do think that um, I do think that the hardest point is in the uh, years just ahead. And then once we get past that, I think it'll be a little bit easier for a while. So this is these are how I actually feel like things are going to progress over the next six to seven years. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, yeah, no, this is. I, I hope that this kind of gets everyone on the same page again. Because yes, timelines are a little bit longer than I'd hoped. But I think that also, like, what's that rule where people say it's like people always overestimate the short-term impact but underestimate the long-term impact? So I'm hoping that my predictions are getting a little bit more grounded in reality and a little bit more accurate to how things are actually going to play out. So thanks for watching. Cheers. Have a good one.